great privilege to have Cece Sandy. So welcome, Cece. How are you? Hello, I'm fine. Well, first of all, can I just say thank you so much for inviting me to talk about the improvement of and expressing yourself in your performance. I'm really excited about it because I want to hear all of the questions that your people have today. Well, hopefully you're not going to be anything too tricky. It's, it's mainly about <laughs> your experiences and things like that. I think the first one is, you know, introduce who you are, your background in music, where, where you kind of came from, or what brings you to where you are now, really. Ooh. Well, my name's Cece, Cece Sammy. Now I'm married, so it's Sammy Lightfoot. <laughs> um, I've been working in the industry for about 25 years. In so saying, I'm not going to give my age away, but you can do the maths from there. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I've been working in the industry for a very long time. And I love that I started at a very young age, not knowing where I would have actually ended up. So I'll start at the very beginning. Many of you might know I was born in the Caribbean, in Trinidad. And I was obsessed with a pianist in the classical world called Liberace. I was literally obsessed with this man. I love the fact that he had the jewels, you know, he sat at the piano, you had the candelabra, you had everything. He made it huge in his performance on stage. And when I saw that, I thought, ah, oh, I want to work in the industry somehow. <laughs> and I practiced lots. My mother really encouraged me in many ways. And I'm really glad that she did, because without doing that, I wouldn't have been in the situation that I was when I was 17. So I moved to the UK when I was 14. And I was 17, happened to be somewhere where some people heard me singing. I wasn't playing the piano, but I was singing and playing the piano. And um, they said, we'd like you to come for an audition. Now, like I said, I was obsessed with classical music. However, they were auditioning for something in the pop world. So I wasn't sh quite sure about it at the time. I thought, oh, I'm not sure this is pop music. You know, what will that do for me? Will, you know, will I be good at it? I'm, I'm not sure. I had lots of uncertainty at that point. However, like I said, I practiced constantly. So I went in, went to the audition, and the people said that they loved what I did. And my first job, my first job was with Diana Ross. Wow. Now that was incredible. I was so nervous and she was so kind in many ways because at the time I was 17, but a lot of the other vocal, you know, backing singers were in their thirties at the time. And so I felt really, what, what am I doing? How do I do this? What do I do on a stage? Do I lift my hands up? At what point do I do it? Do I step to the left? Do I step to the right? I had no idea what to do. So I kind of just observed everyone else around me and I kind of followed. <laughs> Um, and the more I did it, the more relaxed and in, encouraged I felt about it. So I'll now fast forward in time. I did my backing vocals for people like Dan Ross, Julio Iglesias, several other people. Loved it. But like I said, my background was practicing away on the piano. And um, I happened to be what you guys will remember way back in the day pop idol that came about and I was again invited to audition and to go into to meet some people and I did and they said to me we love the fact that you're very technical because of the classical side I was able to read music and sort of get into the detail of what the voice did and how it could help people and it was very important for them that, that the age of music competition shows of where they had to audition them but in a short space of time they had to deliver and if you got to a certain stage, you went to the next and to the next. And, you know, it'd be two minutes for a song. And in your performance, the visual as well as vocally, you had to, you know, do what you had to do. And one thing led to another. And I, my company was set up in such a way whereby many different competition shows came up, which I loved. And I expanded it by constantly studying and then a lot of these shows ended up being in Los Angeles and New York, all around the States. And so I was able to get involved in a lot of those um, television shows. So as well as doing things in the 
in the UK, I was able to do things abroad. I then moved into uh, the film world, sort of working with different people. And I loved every minute of it. But everything that we're talking about today, which is about how to improve and convey something, is what I had to learn in situation. So I would love, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask, because I'm looking forward to, uh, to answer those. Well, I've got one that I'm actually itching to ask you that just comes into my mind there. How, how much did you think that was all natural ability and how much did you have to bring it on and really work hard to bring what you had naturally to the levels that you fought? What, what, what would you, you know, kind of give us an idea? The first thing I will say, it's work hard, work hard, work hard. In my own experience, you can be hugely talented, but if you are not rehearsing over and over again, that's going to be a huge issue if you're wanting to, to move forward. For instance, you all, well, sorry, before I say for instance, the other area that you need to watch is that you will always fall. We always do. But it, the question is, what do you do when you fall? If you fall, do you choose to stay lying down and feeling sorry for yourself? Or do you go, this is terrible. Why did I not get that? No, feel that, but use music as a tool and as a weapon. Listen to a song, let it encourage you and pick your, you know, stand up and start again, try again. It's all about working hard. Well, the one thing I noticed that we were lucky enough to have you come down the River Studios was the fact that you, really got your teeth into the the emotion and the message of the of the song and, and hopefully we can come to that in a little bit rather than go out of sequence so what does your job entail now Cece what's your sort of day-to-day -day, uh, job in the music industry a lot of it is consulting for people so because I'm a firm believer in that don't try to copy someone else yes it's very good to use them as you know as someone who will inspire you. That's very important, but then you need to make a list. And I love doing that with people as a consultant where I would say, okay, sit down, make a list. What are your pros and your cons? What do you find? Five points that you would think as your strength, five points that you might think as your weakness. Now, don't be afraid of what you think that weakness is. Because if you start making steps and leaning towards you see as your strength, that is a point. So a lot of what I love to do, like I said, is consulting to give advice, whether it's to the singer, whether it's to the musician, whether it is the manager, whether it is uh, people at different levels. Because again, one thing I learned from having the opportunity to have my business in Los Angeles is don't ever put yourself in a box. If anyone said to me that I started off as a backing vocalist that went on to being a vocal coach, being then pulled into a situation whereby not only singers would be calling to ask advice, but that managers, successful managers asking, oh, actually, what do we do in this situation? Because troubleshooting is, it's, I love doing it, but that is something that grew. And I would say to all of you, don't put yourself in a box. What you're doing now is great, but always keep your options open because you will find other things that you're sort of leaning towards because that's the part of being creative, isn't it? Absolutely. And so at what point do you think uh, an artist's career, do they sort of need to consider vocal coaching? At what point um, does a band member and, and anyone need to sort of think, right, I need a vocal coach? Well, I would say vocal coaches are, mm quite important for all of us. I'm a vocal coach, but having a friend of mine who is a vocal coach who can sort of dissect my voice is great. I think it's something that we should all do. And it's not just for singing, but it's for speaking. It's for perhaps we need to speak to someone, but we're not sure, we're feeling really nervous or we've had an argument with them and we're not sure how to have a healthy conversation with them. And those are all the things that vocal coaching teaches you, really, in many ways. Again, people put things in boxes. A vocal coach absolutely will go through the vocals, but a vocal coach can actually go through the ability to speak to each other, to speak to, if we go to an audition, for instance, it's not just about the performance, but it's about the minute you walk through the door. 
you're being assessed. <laughs> um, for me, to this day, if there's a job that I'm about to do, but I need to meet the boss person of that job that I have to report to, I'll get nervous to this day. But I have to have a vocal coach who is a friend, and I will say, okay, have listened to this. What do you think? And they'll tell me the good, the bad, the in-between. <laughs> so I really want to tell all of you, don't think that having to see a vocal coach will put you as you're not good enough or your voice is not good enough, your speech is not good enough. It's a simple way of looking at it as we are constantly learning and growing and you know, uplifting ourselves by seeing different people to input into our lives. I mean, I'm, I'm a firm believer that everyone should have a vocal coach the same as a boxer needs a coach to go in the ring. Agreed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be facing the... Uh, well, think the, of it. Think of it uh, in, in terms of sport. You will always have a coach, won't you? And it's not because if you're a footballer, if you're a rugby player, if you're a tennis player, you're not not able to do what you love and what people know you for doing, but you need someone who will, you know, input into what, you've, you've got a second pair of eyes, put it that way. And no. I will bring it back, it goes to every level, not only singing, but to all aspects. If you can speak, you can sing, but at the same time, in speaking, you've got to develop that. It's very important. I think you're going to realms of communication there, which is absolutely right. And it's interesting that you, you said that. I mean, the amount of auditions, and you've done it as well, that you can almost tell someone coming in the room whether they're going to be good or not. 95% <laughs> of the time. It's ridiculous how you know, that presence and that posture and that coming straight away, it, very rarely you is it wrong, do you know what I mean? And so there's a good, that's a good tip in itself for that first impression. And what about band members then? Because in, and people that are in duos, I think this is often forgotten that they just think they're, they've got to get someone to accompany them on the keyboard or guitar. But, you know, I mean, how important is it for you to, that everybody in a group or a band is kind of contributing vocally? I think it's crucial that everyone contributes and not just contributing when they are on stage, but understanding that the rehearsal leading up to the performance is what you will be able to deliver. A perfect example many, many years ago, people didn't have the, they didn't use the phrases that we would use today, where we would say, okay, right, you are the drummer, you are the guitar player, but we don't need to practice you joining in to sing. You know, let's just meet on the day and perform. You see, it didn't quite work like that. And again, this brings us back to the re-education of how musicians functioned. They didn't have the title, you are the vocal coach, now you are the back, no, they were musicians. Being a musician, your voice is an instrument. Whatever you're playing, that is an instrument. And it's important to gather together and in those rehearsals, you're not just playing and having fun, yes you are, but if you are about to go onto a stage with other people, it's no longer about you, it's about the audience. Now, if it's about the audience, it's absolutely about you rehearsing it, working out the vocals, working out, okay, if this is the lead singer, the person who is drumming, as an example, or the person who's playing the guitar and they're doing all their parts, they, you are all there as a band to encourage each other. You are leaning on each other. It's like, a, it's a building. If you don't have one wall put up in the right way, it will get lopsided. And it's the same with the band. So the guitarist, let them practice, but they need to come together with the singer so that they are feeling each other. So the guitarist could be actually just saying a word at a certain point of the song. And the lead singer goes, oh my gosh, yes, actually mentally that really helped me because I can't see my audience. I bring it back. It's always about the audience. If you're doing it for yourself, do it in your room and that's it. But if you want to have an audience in front of you, it's no longer about you. It's about as a team, you join and you become together as one. Brilliant, brilliant advice, yeah. And so just in general, just in singers and anyone, what are your, what's your 
best tips for conveying an emotion in a song and I've got a bit of an idea what you're going to say but, <laughs> but it's always nice to hear it from you because you're so elegant and your dick is so brilliant so sorry what so tips? what is it you want you want me to uh, yeah what's your tips for conveying an emotion in the song what's the best tips for singers from you you see there's so many tips in conveying a song the first thing I will say is read the don't just sing the song read the lyrics and I talk a lot about, there's something called circles of concentration. And many actors use this. So my tips would be following many things that you will find actors doing, read the lyrics and then ask yourself, okay, from my perspective, the person who, think of yourself, if you wrote it, what were you thinking? Or if you were the listener, how would you interpret that? It's actually looking at every, line and where that song is going in terms of the lyrics. Ask yourself, well, why did I feel? Give, give me a, a, a line of a song that you love, for instance. God, you're putting me on the spot, aren't you? Or a, or a title of a song oh. that you love. Um, oh, I don't know. I was quite like, I was, the thing that came into my mind was Tears for Fears, Mad World, do you know what I mean? Uh, okay, so here we go. Not perfect, let's, let's leave a perfect example. And when you, when you think of that, what adjective comes to you? One word. Questioning, kind of philosophical, kind of... Kind Questioning, of, uh, philosophical. And yeah. does that make you happy? Does it make you grounded? Where does it take you? It makes me very thoughtful and kind of... Um, questioning I don't know if that's helping you <laughs> no that's no but that's great but I'm using this as an example because all of you listening to this this is something that you can and should do with yourself you've got a song that you're performing, start questioning yourself about it. Make those, find out what immediately comes to you, thoughtful, provoking, whatever it is, write it down and then start in communicating that song in a performance, showing and being vulnerable to show your audience that. Now, bear in mind, they won't know what's going through your mind when you're thinking it, but they will see and they will be involved in your performance. You see, I'm a firm believer that lyrics is the key. And again, that is what many years ago people used as they were playing in front of a band or in front of an audience. It was, they had to. And that's what I want to encourage. It's wonderful that we've got the internet and we've got wonderful ways of copying and imitating people that we see. But I also want you to think of how can we, as a performer, communicate directly to that audience live? Or as we are right now speaking through the internet, how do you communicate what you're feeling so that someone else through music can have their own feeling? <laughs> Well, I think, I think what's quite evident, um, and especially, and you've, you've judged many of the competitions we've done together uh, with open mic and stuff like that, sometimes it's very obvious that someone is giving an emotion to a song, but it's almost like their whole song, because the song is a bit of anguish and sorrow, the whole song's like that, and it ends up becoming a bit Moorish. What's your, what's your tips for that on, uh, on trying to tune in and give a dynamic performance rather than the whole overall because that's quite yes. important because it becomes very heavy and 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 and, and becomes a bit unconnected and it's all just oh you know absolutely and i would this is where i would bring it back into what actors do circles of concentration so for instance there are four that i tell people think of one way where you're talking to yourself like right now i'm talking to myself and i've sort of softened my voice as I'm speaking to all of you and I'm not looking at you but I'm looking out and really thinking what is it that I'm going through right now that's your performance that's one stage the first circle of concentration the second circle of concentration is when you're speaking to one person directly it's just you and I and this is how I feel why do I feel that way and you are directly leading that for, but you know there's a huge audience then the third circle of concentration you've got a few people. So you're looking at acknowledging all of them. So you're gonna start raising your voice naturally, even with your hands or even in your stillness, however you perform. And then you've got the arena. Now, so many, we go a bit crazy and this is where we get loud, very loud if we want to, you see, this is where that point comes. And then, so my point is the first, 
four circles of concentration, you've got to move between these constantly through a song. You've got the verse, you've got the bridge, you've got the chorus. Now, what do you choose to be that place where you would have what we would call the money, the money notes, <laughs> or the money feeling that you communicate to your audience? So I bring it back, circles of concentration. Remember, we are singers, but singers are actors. Um, but can I just say, I really want to encourage people to, to remember, if they don't remember anything that I've said, a singer is an actor. Absolutely, circles of concentration will lead you in and out of what those perform, what that performance, what that song means. Absolutely. So here's a tricky one. And for singers out there, how do they focus on their technique without losing the emotion of the song? Vocal coach. <laughs> this is where it's so important. You know, one way of looking at, at it, and I say this to many people that I've worked with before, I say, let's do the technique and concentrate on that first. Afterwards, throw it out. Because your voice, your body, visually, everything will fall into place. There are three points where this is concerned. One, the technique. As you're really rehearsing the song, think about what you need to do so that you can continue and do a long show with song after song and you're not going to lose your voice. But after that, you've got to think vocally, the vocal performance without the restrictions of what the technique can place on the voice. It's very important because it's not saying that you have to be perfectly technique or technical, but if you have that and it's in your blood for that song, it would naturally kick in. So that way, when you're performing, you move into concentrating on the vocal and the visual. But this is where that rehearsal is so important. If you're rehearsing, you don't say, okay, I've got a, a gig that's coming up and it's in a month and I'll start rehearsing maybe two days before. No tech, you, you have no technique that's kicked in. But if you've been rehearsing for a month, or you know, depending on how you do it, if depending on how long you've been covering the technique, then you stop and you start thinking of the vocal performance, being free a bit more and with the visual. I've got a really good question here. Is there a difference in your singing technique between when you're performing and when you're going to record in the studio? Well, I think that there, there are different with touch styles that you should use if when you're in the studio. For live, you've got to ensure that you are um, monitoring, especially if you've got night after night, you've got to ensure that you are working on all aspects, which is the circle of concentration that I was talking about, starting from a quiet place where you're talking to one and then you're reaching out into other people and then you bring it back and it's you know it's constantly moving when you're in the studio you can get away with a bit of more stuff so to speak where you don't have to be um so technically right you can i would say you know go a bit further in what you want to do vocally but if you are recording three songs in one day, that will be a problem. But if it's one song, I mean, I've worked with people where I say, you, you can sing a bit harder because it's in the moment. And again, I will say, I'm not saying forget about the technique, but in that one situation, you, it's good to, you know, just be a bit more, not daring, I don't want to use that word, but be a bit more risky in afterwards, your voice might not be what you want it to be. And is there any particular tips when someone goes into a recording studio for them to get the best out of their vocal? Again, thinking about the lyrics, I will say concentrate on your technique constantly. That is your everyday being. For instance, you know, you, you get up, you brush your teeth. You've got to think of the technique that way. And when you go into the studio, you've got to think that People are not visually seeing you. What they're hearing purely is your vocal. So do you want to concentrate on having your voice as the driving force? Because at certain points, 
that's what it needs to be. At other points, maybe the guitar will then take over. For instance, think about it. There are some songs that you would listen to. The singer, well, I'll ask you, is the singer the lead instrument? You see, when I listen to certain songs on the radio or the songs that have been sent to me, that's how my brain works. I will go, okay, I'm listening to the song. And depending on how it was not just recorded by the producer, but how the singer has sung it, I will hear, oh, actually, the drums is the lead in this. Oh, actually, the guitar is the lead in this. Oh, it's the vocal that's the lead. Not saying that one is better than the other. It's just that if you're really analyzing it, technically, a performance takes its place sometimes for the whole song or sometimes for parts of the song. So I bring it back. The technique generally, not specifically, but generally, if you're recording is very different to live. How I would train someone for the recording studio, I will be, I will let them experiment a lot more. Whereas if it's live, in the rehearsal, we will try different things, but once they're on stage for that audience, they can't. It's too risky, so I bring it back. One is riskier than the other. They're both good and they're both just as difficult, but for different reasons. That's really interesting. So um, what, what, we've got obviously lots of young singers and a few older ones. What if, what if someone wants to find a vocal coach? What's the best bit of advice you can give to them to make sure they're getting the right vocal coach for them? The biggest thing I would say is, and I'll use my company as an example, I have a variety of different people who are brilliant vocal coaches, including myself, <laughs> but it's about how you feel when you're in, this, in the class or in the session with the person. You see, there are some people that would respond. I've had clients where I would know I won't use my voice as an example for them because they might not feel comfortable with it. Then you have other votes. So I would, use, I would use a different way of translating what they need to know. You might be a person who prefers having the example given to you by your coach, or you might have, prefer someone who talks a lot and they use their hands like I do, whereas someone might actually find that distracting. So I think it's really about you finding the coach that you feel most comfortable with. There are many great vocal coaches in our country and I have to tell you, not enough people recognize that. You know, in America, they've had no choice but to embrace the fact that they've got to see vocal coaches because it's, so, it's such a huge place and they've got to reach to a certain point, otherwise they don't get the opportunity. But here in the UK, I want to really encourage all of you out there that's listening to this, there is nothing wrong to have a vocal coach. All you need to do is to find the vocal coach that you can really be honest with and feel comfortable with. Some people concentrate on the technique only. Some of them will concentrate on the technique and the performance. Um, and some will concentrate purely on the backing vocals. So I would say, don't feel that you are, you have to be bound to someone forever. I think it's about what stage you're at and what you think you need. And you it's, I bring it back, it's about feeling comfortable. I've got another lovely, great question off the cuff that comes into my head. <laughs> um, so basically what I see a lot in the competition and, and, uh, and actually down the studio is you can hear someone, their, their origins of where they're being taught. A great example is being yes. classical taught. So yes. what's your advice for someone who's getting a bit of a court between two coaches sometimes, one pop, one classical? What's your advice for someone who's been taught by a variety of coaches and, and it's getting to the point now where you're, you're seeing that in the vocal? Yes, and that's not good, by the way. Um, I think when that happens, you've got to address it. So I will bring it back to... The core foundation of what you must have first and foremost is someone who understands the technique. Because if you understand the technique, that's the base. And think about it, in pop music, the 
technique that's used was actually taken from the classical world. <laughs> it really was. The, the pure difference is you're not having to sustain notes in a particular way, and you don't have to be as in tune as you would have to in the classical world. It's very, very different. So what I would encourage is really figuring out you as an artist, try out working with a technician first, <laughs> because you've got that, and then figure out where do you want to take your voice? Is it in that pop rock element? Or is it in a more and I don't want to just use the word classical loosely, because it could be, you know, you have someone like Barbara Streisand, who you wouldn't say that she's classical, but it's a certain form of singing. Um, so I would say it's really understanding the style that where you want to take your voice. And for some people, they only have one, and again, it's not bad, but it's really understanding the genre that is better for you as a singer. So again, um, you know, what I do is I encourage people not to sort of restrict themselves, but at the same time, you've got to be honest with yourself about the reaction you've had from other people that perhaps this genre is better for you or, you know, or another one. Yeah, and I, I, I think, uh, yeah, people get really caught with that. And I think at some point, and hopefully you agree with me, you might not, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that once you get to a point and you find out, look, I want to be pop, or I want to be classical, or I want to be rock, that you kind of maybe stick to that lane in, in the end because- Agreed, agreed. It, 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 it kind of really kind of, it's almost like it's inbred and it's almost like, I've heard a lot of coaches say, that's going to take us a year or two to almost unblood that a little bit. Yes, because, yes. And you also get, uh, you know, some that obviously brilliantly get the opportunity to go around the world on cruise ships or on, on holiday parks, but they end up getting into a little bit of lazy sort of what I say. Yes. Uh, like a little bit of a butlin's kind of twang to the voice. And yes. So, so again, how, how would someone avoid doing that? Again, I bring it, I think everything the, is about the foundation and a lot of people don't really talk about it. You've got, you've got to understand there are many people who they can do vocal warm up exercises with you, but that's very different from understanding the technique of the voice. Um, again, I'll use an example. I have coaches who I, there's one in particular, he is so good. When I say good, to, put, to have him working with people in terms of moving into different harmonies or with bands, I mean, absolutely brilliant at what, he's, what he does. And depending on the project, I will bring him on board to work with the singers. Now, if it is someone who they've got the technique but they need a bit more of the, what you, you discussed about that rock where they need to be a bit, have that rougher tone in the voice. Now I wouldn't put the singer with that coach because the coach that you then need is someone who's actually, and definitely within rock, you need to give an example. You've got to, you've, you've got to take it into that, um, dangerous sound that you want to make sure you don't get problems with the vocal cords after. Um, so again, I bring it back. It really depends. I think everything starts with the foundation, the technique of the voice and understanding that yes, every vocal coach can teach you vocal warm-ups, but it doesn't mean that they can lay the technician point in. If you start with that, you can then be diverted into the other places. And, but I would also say this, I would like to say this to any vocal coaches listening to this, to be honest with yourself, what type of vocal coach are you? There are some vocal coaches that they specialize and don't be afraid of saying that directly to the people, if that makes sense. So I'm going to just sort of, you know, going into a lot of te technical stuff. And I guess we, you know, you could certainly talk all day on that because that's so, so skilled in that. What other important attributes do you feel that singers need to have in order to make it in the industry? What are the other important elements and ingredients? To make it in the industry, I would say one of the first things is understanding it's a business. <laughs> I think in understanding that, it, that it's a business, you won't take things so personally. I think it's it's crucial. I meet so many people and they've worked on their vocals, they've worked on their performance, but they don't seem to understand that 
it's a business. And so you've got to have other avenues that you have opened. So you're performing, but at the same time, you might need to be able to, you know, learn a bit more about the social media and what you can do yourself and then bring other people on board that can help with that. Um, and this is about being in the pop industry you're talking about, yes? Yeah, in general, yeah. Yeah. And I would say also speaking and asking opinions of people in the industry that you meet, like we're doing right now. I, I think the biggest thing is about not putting yourself in a box. I know I talked about this earlier, but it really comes back to that. I think it's a, it's a job. If you are, let's say, if you sell clothes in a shop, you've got to go and ask the client or the person who's walked in and you see them looking, you need, you know, you would say, is there any way I can help you? You need to ask, what can you do if you're going for an audition? Is there anything in particular you're looking for? Um, because I know people that I've met who've come to ask for suiting jobs from my company, that is, is what works, where people are open. They're not closed and basically saying, well, this is how it's done, blah, 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 blah. No, we're, we're always, all of us, I'm still learning. You're still learning. We're all still learning. So I would think it's about being very open to um, different opportunities that may come your way, not putting yourself in a box to the person that you're wanting to help you. And, and I suppose um, it, we're touching upon this already, but what other opportunities can you give examples of that singers can do to advance their careers? What other things and opportunities are out there? I would say on the internet, there are many places that they can go to on YouTube to find out or, you know, looking um, online to see what jobs are happening. And I bring it back, you know, someone who wants to be a pop star, for instance, and they will say, oh, I want to be a pop star and I've gone to this audition. Um, what else should I do? What I would say is continue doing auditions. You know, don't say, oh, I did it so I can't do it again. There are many, many well-known artists who have gone several times or get involved with songwriting, get involved in understanding the business side um, because there's music on every level, not just in the box that you might put it in. You've got job opportunities where perhaps, you know, on many films, many TV, I mean, my company opened up in a wonderful way, actually, in that area. Now, would I have thought that that would have happened? No, I wouldn't. But it happened as simply as, you know, saying to someone, oh, why don't you have a listen to this? This might help you in terms of, in terms of your speak, speaking. And because at that point, I was only primarily seeing folk, um, singers. But then it diverted into actors who said, oh, my gosh, actually, yes, that worked really brilliantly. So can I hire you again? <laughs> and one then spoke to another and then spoke to another. Um, so I would say it's really keeping yourself open um, and not putting yourself in a box. I really, I really, I really want you guys to, to remember that. And is there anything in particular, um, bearing in mind we've got all ranges today, but, you know, is there anything in particular that an up and coming singer should focus on to start with? Technique. <laughs> okay, nice easy one. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the best advice that you ever you ever received and what you could pass on to people tonight for an up and coming singer? What's the best advice you could give? Them? Ah, that's a, that's a, what, cause I've had, honestly, I've had so many great tips from people that I've met in the industry and I've gotten great tips from, I mean, I would say clients, students, where you, you're listening to them, you're like, oh my gosh, and then they say to you, do you know what, how that worked? And I'm sort of analyzing what they're saying. I'm like, oh, actually, I remember that for you when I'm working with you. Um, I would say the best tip is about being very open, knowing that in your mistakes, you can have your greatest strength grow from that. I'll give a perfect example. I, um, and I've spoken about this before, four months after I had my daughter, she's nine years old now, um, so this was eight years ago, I had her and I had a near-death experience and where I couldn't speak, I could not walk, I had to relearn to do all of those things because I had a fully ruptured brain aneurysm. It was terrible. But the best advice I had was... You know, the doctor, believe it or not, 
encouraged me by saying, because I was so thankful for what they did at the hospital and I invited him and his wife to bring their two girls for me to do a lesson because, you know, it, it took, you know, some time for me to get better. But anyway, I invited them. And the best thing they said was, it was the most confident, um, it really helped their children in terms of how they functioned at school because they had other issues at their school and being able to sit down. And it really encouraged me when I thought, you know what? You can fall and you can make an offering, so to speak, to people and say, look, I'll do this for you, even when you're at your lowest. And what came out of that for me was, I still provide something good for people. Now, I couldn't fully speak at that point. I could still give a lesson, but it wasn't at a most comfortable place. It was sort of working through it. So what I would say is the, one of the best tips I had was that I was great when I thought I was not. So I would encourage people, when you fall or you feel you've fallen, let's say you've not done well, you've not gotten audition that you've done, or you're just having a low day, for all of you in what we're going through right now in the country where you can't meet and see people as you used to, use that moment to actually encourage you. Record yourself, listen back and find one thing, at least one thing that you go, my gosh, I did that. And that's so much more improved. And I did that for myself. So I've got a good one here. It, uh, who, who in your whole career could you put out there and you think they had the best vocal that you ever came across? I could never say that because I think that people deliver on so many levels for different reasons. For one person, Kathleen Battle, she is a black, older, classical singer that I adore. Now, there's a reason why I like listening to her voice. Whereas you could have me listen to Whitney Houston, come very, very different. And I love listening to her voice for a very different reason. You see? <laughs> so I, I can't say, I don't think there is, this is the singer that I adore or I like to listen to. I like all, it depends the, the mood, the feeling that I've got, including the genre. I like to listen to all genres. I love class um, rock music as well. Love, love to watch the performance. They're on stage, they're taking over. <laughs> I don't have a preference. You, you've kind of ruined my next question a little bit. <laughs> oh, what, what's that? The next question was what artists have stood out for you and what did they do to make them stand out? But you kind of answered that, <laughs> you kind of answered that in a bi 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 way. It, de it depends, aren't we? We're all creative, so think about it. I mean, people sometimes say, I will only listen to this. I'm like, really? why don't you try this? Sometimes it could be because you're feeling a certain way and you put a certain type of music on or you might put something else, but you've got to open, open up because sometimes, you know, the genres that you didn't expect would sort of make you inspired to do something. One, 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 one question for me and then we're going to open up because I can see some brilliant questions coming in. Which <laughs> some, 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 some have really thought about it well. What really makes an artist, or what's the ingredients of all the artists that you like? What's the common denominator to make them really stand out? Working really hard and not being afraid to try again when they've made their, what they think is their biggest mistake. And I lied a little bit. How often do you still sing? <laughs> I can't stop. Let's put it that way. Every day? <laughs> Every day, yes. I can't yeah. stop. It's For me, it's just, when it's in your blood, it's in your blood, isn't it? <laughs> it's, brilliant. Uh, it's always great to talk to you so i'm going to look proud uh, because i've noticed we're uh that just seemed like the quickest ever <laughs> lewis i'm just seeing some questions coming in did you want to coordinate um some of the better questions or collate them together so that uh cc can kind of give the responses yeah of course i'll, uh, I'll try to cover as many as possible that we've got here um cc can you hear me okay yes i can okay wicked um so we've got a few so a, a, a couple of people have mentioned um power and you know, some people I've mentioned what, sorry, power. So when, when to really let go when you sing? When when is it okay to belt? And and uh, they've mentioned that the they have better tone and more control when they sing softer. So is it okay to always sing like that, or is it a kind of necessity for you know you have to have the power in on certain occasions? No, you absolutely do not need to have the power every time. 
I think, it, again, it's about knowing your voice. So if you feel that your voice is better in that um, quieter place, the key will be start at your like, quieter than your quiet point. <laughs> Think of it as if you were to drive and, you know, you're in a man, you have a manual car. I can't drive a manual, it's terrible. But, you know, you're sort of in first gear, then you're into second, into third. Now, for one person, that first gear is going to be different to a different singer. So for you, who's asking the question, if you have that quiet voice, don't be ashamed of it. I love listening to quiet voices but you've got to know how to develop it. And this is where the technique comes in, where you will develop a searching point, which is your quiet moment. And then you're, you will have the, the, the place where you can not belt because not every singer should be doing that, but you can give us that feeling. It could be maybe a little crack in the voice, or it could be, you know, the way that you would sing a searching word and it, you'd really play with that word make it warmer or you could make it sound colder I mean there are different things that you can do with those type of voices um, so I would encourage people with that really good advice there um, I suppose just just to add to that any tips for some people who get a bit self-conscious when it comes to uh, you know letting go a little bit and, and really belting it out and is there any kind of quick confidence tips to kind of overcome that, I suppose, self-consciousness they get uh, when they're really going for it. Okay, well, we'll do it right now. So <laughs> I like to be practical. So actually just everyone, let's do this, okay? And don't be ashamed of it. I can be a bit crazy, I know. Okay, so right now I'm going to say, goo, G, think G O O, goo. And now we're going to, I'm gonna say it and then I want you to repeat. Goo. Okay. Go! 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 Now, the reason I did that is because I want all of you to know we all feel self conscious at different points in our life. So, the, the issue is taking that risk, trying trying again and knowing that you know you could be at home on your own you could be just walking around in the kitchen or in the bathroom and it's a really important exercise to do whereby you're doing things quietly or at the middle point of your voice or a bit louder um, and then get a friend who you trust or someone in your family that you trust and try it with them I think it's very important for everyone to know that if you have every, any artist that you love and you adore, I guarantee you they have gone through their own sense of being self-conscious about what they do and how people would react to them. That is the danger of being the creative artists that we are. So only you can sort of guide yourself in that. So my top tip would be, Try to do that just walking around the house where you're doing the goo quietly at the middle point of your voice, really loud. And even more so, try walking down the road. I've done this before and I'm like, okay, I know they think I'm a bit crazy, but it's okay. Walk down the street and then just, you know, let it out. Just be like, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. You just, <laughs> do you see? I do. I think, I think my girlfriend will get a bit annoyed if I walk around the house doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I said when no one's there. And then, and then you try that with her. But like I said, it's really important because it starts to take off those shields that we put up. And we do that from the time that we are children and we can talk. Fantastic. No, and really good advice. And it's unfortunate, but it's something that we do have to face. Really good. Um, if, we, if we go for a slightly different topic then, can you uh, give any tips out for not tiring your voice whilst performing? Any, any good tips for... Well, first of all, I would really encourage people to drink water. Many, many singers don't drink enough. You've got to understand that the science of the voice and the way it's made up 
um, you really got to nurture it <laughs> and look after it. Um, so I would say that's really important to do, drinking lots of water. I think um, being aware and listening to what your voice is telling you, because it will get tired from time to time, even if you put the technique into shape. So it's understanding um, every day, doing the warm-up exercises, but have a, a specific time. So you should start at, I would say, five minutes. But then if you're starting to find that really easy, extend it into 10 minutes. You know, Michael Jackson used to, and many people talk about it, um, he used to warm up his voice several times a day. And again, I would encourage people, it really depends on how your, your voice functions and listen to it. Many singers don't listen to what their voice is telling them. If it's feeling tired, it could be because you've sung, now stop. For others, it could be saying, you're not looking after me. Please warm my voice up because I need the warm up before I wake up. <laughs> sure. Good, good advice again. Um, we, we've had quite a few ask a similar sort of question. So I suppose there's a couple of tips on this, but I mean, first off, someone's asking what, who's your, what's your company called and how can they, how can they get in touch? <laughs> you can get me on, actually just put my name, www.ccsammy.com. And my company is CCA Entertainment. But yes, if you just look up my name, you'll find the necessary place to send me an email. I really want you to nurture your voice because whether you're a singer, or a violinist, a guitarist, a drummer, you need your voice because you've got to talk about what you've been doing, whether it's talking or singing. So really nurture your voice. I'm gonna say it again, drink water, warm up your voice because in warming up your voice, it's not only for singing, but it's for being. Good. And what, what about for an artist? I mean, I suppose the question is, do you have to spend a lot of money to get a good vocal coach? What about some people no. are in a position to do that? No, no. And this is the mistake that many people make. They think they've got to pay big to get good. <laughs> and, you know, I would put it this way. You can do things if you can't afford it. And it is expensive. So ways to make it not so expensive, but at the same time, you're able to get the same quality of work maybe join together with three other people because i know i could have four people in front of me and i can be working individually on each of their voices you see um you can start that's one way of doing it another way of doing it is there are vocal coaches that function at different levels so you have a new vocal coach who will charge cheaper and then it starts growing according to the person that you're working with. And it's one thing that my company did for, for, for so long, which was really important because I didn't want people to feel that if they didn't have finance, that they couldn't have the equivalent of what other people were having. Now, the paperwork of it obviously would be different. You may not have you know, a person's name that you know of, but you will still get good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, really, really good. So, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it, and I suppose it comes back to what you mentioned earlier about just finding someone who you get along with, who you're comfortable with, and brings the best out of you. Exactly, exactly. And I bring it back to many years ago, which is something that we really should, um, you know, remember. Uh, that's what people did. They just didn't have the, the name or the title of I'm a vocal coach, but they would be helping each other and they understood what they, they had to do to make it work. So we've just, we've grown now and understand more of the science of it. Okay. Um, you got any tips for uh, using your eyes to show the emotion of a song? How, how can facial expressions play a part in it? Perfect, that's a really good question. Using your mirror as an example. It's important to, whether it's in your bedroom or whether it's um, actually your computer you can use and direct yourself. You don't have to look at yourself, but look just above. But get used to keeping your eyes fixed, but not so that you're not blinking, you know? And, um, and then looking at other places and thinking about what the lyrics are saying. But it's very important in terms of the eye contact because if you move the eyes at the wrong point of the song, 
people will go, I don't believe you. This is the psychology now that I'm going to start talking about. <laughs> um, people need, because artists have to learn, don't let your nerves be shown by your eyes just flitting around, because that happens often, or people closing their eyes because they just, they, they can't reach out to their audience. If you're going to close your eyes, let it be because it's deliberate. It's a deliberate action, not because it's a, you know, a shield that you're putting out in front of you. Yeah, fantastic, no, really, really good again. Um, I suppose we've got, we got a couple more questions and then we'll probably wrap up for this evening. Um, We've got one about, uh, I suppose I'm rephrasing, but what's the best way to find your natural voice as a singer? Is there a good, good you know, should singers identify what their natural voice is and their natural tone and, and really play with that? That's, that's very good to do that, but it's very difficult as well because our speaking voice is our natural place of being. Now, for some people, their natural speaking voice is not. <laughs> so again, it comes back to the technique side of things. Uh, the, what I will say to this person is, if this is something that you're wanting to discover more, specifically a technique, not a coach who does the vocal warm up, but someone who understands the science, the technique side of it, they will help guide you with that. Really good. Um, I think we'll do the last last question. Uh, unless last anyone, question. <laughs> unless there's any more in, in the chat. Um, if if we do, uh, do you have any tips for writing melodies um, with your own vocal range in mind? So, how, any top tips when a, uh, an artist is approaching a song and how to write maybe a top line or a melody? Well, a few things with that. One, if you are a pianist, if you play the piano, or even if you don't play the piano, that's why I think it's so important. If you have it play certain notes, just with one finger. Don't make it too complicated and having to do a whole performance, but just press certain notes. And that of itself may help you in terms of writing a song, a lead part. Because many people get caught up where they go, oh, I can't think, I've tried, you know. Well, put a song on that you love, but not in the genre that you would normally listen to. Put a completely different genre on and listen to what you're hearing as the lead because the lead may not be the voice, it might be the drum, it might be the guitar. So just opening up yourself. Again, I bring it back. Don't put yourself or your creativity in a box. Really good, really Sorry, good. Sorry, people have just walked into this. <laughs> no, no, that's okay, that's okay. Um, it's, it's a, yeah. <laughs> I, I think, uh, any more from you, Chris, or, or shall we wrap up for this evening? Well, yeah, I, I think it's been fantastically insightful and, um, Hopefully everyone that's uh, enjoyed that is coming on tonight. And um, what we can obviously do is, um, if Cece's happy, we, we did a workshop down in River when he came down, didn't we, Cece, that we videoed? Yes. And perhaps what we can do is include that, Lewis. There's a couple of articles we've got um, that we can forward as well. And also what we'll do is um, forward um, mass records, those that aren't interested in that. If you are on that this year, you can sign up for next year. And that's one good opportunity to get some free vocal lessons and collaborate and hopefully oh, great. The yes. that, that CC's done. So from all of us, CC, thank you ever so much. It's so appreciated. You know what oh, I mean? thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and guys, we'll do you an email. In a couple of weeks' time, we've got uh, another super yeah. class. I think that's with uh, is it Hewitt in a couple of weeks. Um, um, oh, we've got Audrey in a couple of weeks. Oh, so Audrey. Uh, yeah, so it's a good songwriting one for a couple of weeks' time. So that should be for everyone who's coming on tonight. And um, yeah. Good night and good bless. Thank you ever so much. Hang on, and hang on, can I say one thing? <laughs> As we finish, you know, I like to do this, everyone, all together. So I'm going to say something and I'd like you to say it after me. But you've got to say it really confident and believing in yourself, okay? So here we go. I am me. I am me. I am me. I am me. Nobody else but me. I am me. Nobody else but me. Else but me. Else but me. Else and I'd rather be. And, and I'd rather, rather be, be nobody rather else but me. Nobody else but me. Thank you so much, Thank you. 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 Thank